Hi listeners of the History of Ancient Greece. My name is David Cott, and I'm the host of the History of Spain podcast, a podcast where I talk about the history of my motherland right from the beginning. There were a few commercial Greek colonies in the Iberian Peninsula, and I talk a bit about them in my podcast. But I'm not going to lie. I didn't dedicate much time to that or the period of Roman rule, because I prefer to cover more deeply the subsequent periods of Spanish history. I'm currently telling the story of Visigothic Spain, so the apogee of the Spanish Empire, the Peninsular War, or the Spanish Civil War are still years ahead. My objective is to narrate and explain the history of Spain from a Spanish perspective to an English audience, using both a Spanish and English sources. If I awoke your curiosity, I hope you join me in my journey to explore the history of Spain. Thanks, Ryan, for bringing me this opportunity, and I hope you listeners enjoy the episode. Hello, I'm Ryan Stitt, and welcome back to the History of Ancient Greece, Episode 95, The Greek World Turned Upside Down. Today's episode is brought to you by our new Patreon supporters for May, June, and July. Those being Ryan O., Kathy Chapman, Nicholas Campbell, and Evan Einride Heinem Cliven, as well as PayPal donors Peter Levis and Dale Cook. Once again, I do apologize if I didn't pronounce those correctly, but I do thank you for your donations and support of the podcast. If you too would like to support the History of Ancient Greece, you can become a monthly Patreon supporter or a one-time donor at PayPal. Links to the various sites are in the show notes. And now, let us turn our attention back to the Ancient Greeks. As we discussed in episode 88, in the 430s BC, and especially after Pericles' death, Athens saw the rise of a new type of politician. Traditionally, ambitious men had gained positions of political importance by the support of their philoi, or friends, by marriage to the daughters of other powerful political families, by military and public service, and usually holding the post of strategos, or general, and by forming coalitions with like-minded aristocrats in their factions. Such men, known as the Kaloi Kagathoi, were the best people, had the leisure, the wealth, and most of all, the organization to wield a political influence that was disproportionate to their actual numbers. That's because the demos, or the people, were too dissimilar in their aims and too disorganized to translate their superior numbers into dominance of the ecclesia, except in extraordinary circumstances when a major issue caught their attention. Otherwise, in the routine but still important matters of state, they tended to be influenced by the leaders of the organized aristocratic factions. But these new politicians saw the potential of the demos and sought to forge them into a more potent political force. Their opportunity came in the second half of the 5th century BC thanks to the drastic increase in imperial demands placed upon the Athenians. The growing confidence of the demos in the ecclesia and heliai, or the law courts, and the possibilities offered by a sagaria, or an equal right to speak, in shaping state policy. The Athenians here faced a formidable task in exercising control over a rapidly growing empire and its attendant responsibilities simply by using the political structures implemented by a small city-state. The use of lot for the majority of offices, term limits, and having more than one colleague in an office with equal authority were all useful for protecting the democracy at home from its political enemies. But these were unsuitable limitations in the administration of a powerful empire. And so, there arose a need for some politically active citizens to provide the necessary leadership, and onto the stage stepped these new politicians, often referred to by hostile literary sources as a demagogue, literally meaning the leader of the people, 
or prostatai toi demoi, or the champions of the people. We also discussed in episode 88 how the early part of Pericles' career could be labeled demagogic, while in the second half he was more like a traditional statesman. We also mentioned how, despite this, Pericles wasn't called a demagogue, as the term came to mean someone who not only won power by using the people, but those who used the people to win power, and they came from non-aristocratic backgrounds. This is why the aristocratic Pericles typically did not fall into this category, despite his championing of the people in order to win political popularity. But following his death, Many of these new politicians who had gained power had previously acquired their wealth from business, not from agriculture, and so they didn't come from the traditional families and didn't have the built-in factional power that came with it. So in order to gain political influence, they made direct appeals to the demos and the ecclesia and proposed policies to their benefit. As a result, they were able to get the people, and thus the power, on their side. These new politicians gained their position of political influence by possessing certain skills and by winning over the mass allegiance of the demos. It was necessary for them to be an effective orator in the ecclesia in order to put forward one's views with clarity and vigor and to ward off an opponent's attacks and to discredit his arguments. So important was it to be an effective orator that as we discussed in episode 87, the term retor, meaning literally he who speaks, simply came to mean politician in the late 5th century BC. They also had to possess a mastery of finances and administration so that they could impress the demos, who had neither the time nor the commitment to master such complex details, but who needed this information to make their decisions. In addition, these new politicians needed to have a good grasp of the affairs of foreign policy, especially knowledge of the empire, which was supplied to them by their Zenoi, or guest friends, in the allied cities. Eventually, it was to these retores, and not to the elected public officials, that the demos usually looked for expert advice. However, it was their non-aristocratic background and the political methods that they employed to gain the allegiance of the demos that provoked the greatest hostility and disdain from the Calloi Cagathoi and their like-minded supporters, such as Aristophanes and Thucydides. Because of this, the term demagogue gradually acquired its derogatory meaning as a leader of the mob. Their opposition to and prejudice against these so-called demagogues can best be seen in the career of Cleon. We have discussed Cleon already quite a bit in the recent episodes, but it is never a bad thing to review since he will play a leading role in this episode and beyond. Cleon was not from a traditional landed aristocratic family, but he had inherited a great sum of money from his father, who in turn had taken advantage of the wealth-making opportunities offered by the empire to make his fortune in the leather-making business. And so, his family's wealth gave Cleon the time and leisure needed to involve himself fully in the affairs of state, and to acquire the mastery of administrative detail, especially financial, which appealed to the demos. If he had chosen to pursue his career in the traditional manner of the Calloi Cagathoi, as Nicias had, despite him too coming from a non-aristocratic background, then the literary sources might well have given him the praise that his exceptional abilities would have warranted but he firmly rejected that approach to politics with its built-in hierarchy, conventions, and constant compromises. Plutarch in his treatise titled Rules for Politicians states that Cleon rejected having any political friends on the grounds that they would compromise his integrity in his pursuit of the right and just policy for Athens. By doing so, Cleon was turning his back on traditional philia, or political friendship, in order to advance his own political career and instead he gave his devotion and friendship to the demos, aiming to become their spokesman and their protector, called prostates. And so, Cleon realized that it was not only possible, but easier to gain political power by appealing directly to the demos and the ecclesia, without the need to cultivate old-style political friendships, form coalitions, or hold public office. As a result, the allegiance of the demos became far more important for political success than the support of a narrow circle of influential men. As we also described in episode 88, the development of language in a political context is useful in understanding this new approach to politics, 
the language and ideas of the demagogues towards the aristocratic philia were eventually adapted to describe one's relationship with the demos, stressing that in a politician, the characteristics of loyalty and affection are only acceptable when directed towards the polis, or city-state, and not to one's political friends. Loyalty to and love of the polis and the demos, and not one's circle of friends, would eventually become the most admirable trait in a politician. As these words became common currency in the language of politics, so too did their antonyms. Misodemos, or demos hater, and misopolis, or polis hater. And so politics in Athens would become far more divisive, confrontational, and vicious than at any point before, as political opponents of the demagogues were now treated as enemies of the state, constantly being suspected of treason, conspiracy, and tyranny. It was probably this tough and aggressive approach to politics that led many of the Kaloi Kagathoi, who might have limited the effectiveness of these new politicians and the success of their policies, simply to withdraw from public life, which in turn provoked Thucydides and Aristophanes to portray Cleon and the demagogues in such a lurid and derogatory manner, though not Pericles. In fact, these two politicians, epitomizing the old and the new, could not be more different in the eyes of Thucydides. However, Cleon's policies bear a remarkable similarity to that of Pericles, those being the belief in the necessity of empire, a firm policy towards the allies, a refusal to comply with the demands of the Spartans, and a genuine concern for the welfare of the demos, as reflected in pay for public services and improving their standard of living. And so, as there was a change in the nature of politics in the last third of the 5th century BC, it's his style, and not his policies, that led to the prejudice against and distortion of Cleon the demagogue in the literary sources. The dominance of the old-style politics, based on a complex web of friendships, was now being superseded by a new style, based upon direct appeals to the demos and the forging of them into the most powerful political force in Athens. The public statements of devotion to the city and the demos by these new politicians stress that the clear-cut moral duty of all politicians should be to the state and not to one's circle of friends. They also believe that all of the incompetence of the upper class in public service should be ruthlessly exposed and punished. The Calloway Kagathoi intensely disliked this new style of politics and reacted in one of two ways. While some withdrew from public life, as we mentioned, others made their philia tougher in its methods and far more political. As a result, these friendships, which previously performed social functions and were visible to the public, became hetairei, or political clubs, that met in secret. To the Democrats, they seemed sinister and potentially treasonous, as if they were plotting the overthrow of the democracy. And so, the stage was set for the constitutional upheavals at the end of the century. Although we are getting far ahead of ourselves here, just keep that in mind for when we get there. Turning back to Cleon, in his early career, he deliberately cultivated an anti-aristocratic persona, and on the death of Pericles, he stepped forward as the professed champion of the demos, and as such, he rapidly came to dominate Athenian politics he would become the first of several leading politicians at Athens who commanded respect in the ecclesia without having held the generalship. In fact, in episode 93, we discussed the prominent role that he had in the debates about what to do with the rebellious Mytilenians, which was the first time that he made an appearance in Thucydides' histories. Although rough and unpolished, he was charismatic, with natural eloquence and a powerful voice, and he knew how to work upon the emotions of the Athenian people. His influence lied in his forceful and bullying style of oratory, which was anti-intellectual and anti-aristocratic in tone, as well as in his populism. For this reason, Thucydides and Aristophanes both represented Cleon as a vulgar, warmongering demagogue, though they were not particularly objective in their hatred for him. Their portrayals, though, may be somewhat justified in certain respects, since other sources corroborate some of the statements that they made specifically reporting that he instilled a feeling of mistrust within Athens by using unfair allegations and investigations to get rid of his political opponents, 
In fact, he was said to have employed a number of informants, tasked with keeping watch on the city and providing him with intelligence that he could use as evidence against his political enemies or to convince the demos of his policies. Unlike Pericles, though, Cleon's goals seem to have been short-term oriented. Still, poor Athenians stood to benefit by his policies, though it was at the expense of heavy taxes levied onto their allies. In particular, he strengthened his support among the poorer citizens by increasing the pay for jury work from two to three obols, or half of a drachma. It was a small amount, less than a day's wages for the average laborer, which was six obols, or one drachma, but it was not trivial, as it in itself could provide a livelihood for many of the poorer Athenians. He also may have introduced a property tax for military purposes, and even held a high position connected with the treasury. In addition, the fondness of the Athenians for litigation increased his power, and the practice of sycophancy, or making up material for false charges, enabled him to remove those who were likely to endanger his political power. We have mentioned in previous episodes some various examples of legal charges over the past decade which were prosecuted or were likely prosecuted by Cleon. Well, in the winter of 426-425 BC, after Pythodorus relieved Laches of his command, Cleon too brought a prosecution against him based on his generalship in the unsuccessful First Sicilian Expedition. This also was unsuccessful and was one of the very few times that an Athenian general escaped civil punishment for a defeat. We had mentioned in episode 93 that it's likely that Cleon and Nicias were at least amicable in the years following Pericles' death. Well, after just three short years, if he had not already, it was definitely by this point that Cleon felt that he had no further use for his former aristocratic associates. So he broke off all connection with them and began to openly attack them for political purposes. Cleon's ruling principle seemed to have been an ingrained hatred of the nobility and an equal hatred for Sparta. It was mainly through him that the opportunity of concluding an honorable peace with Sparta was lost in 425 BC, and in his determination to see Sparta humbled, he misled the people as to the extent of the resources of the state and dazzled them by promises of future benefits. But before we get there, since we have already seen some of Thucydides' portrayal of him, Let's circle back and see what Aristophanes, the other literary figure of the time, has to say. As we discussed in episode 54, although we know the names of other comedians and fragments of their work remain, Aristophanes is the lone representative for Athenian old comedy, of which we have intact plays. Athenian old comedy was very much concerned with current personalities, politics, literature, and philosophy, but in ways that make historical interpretation difficult which has led to considerable disagreement among scholars. So we have waited to discuss his plays until we reached the point in the narrative that they were performed, because political context is key in order to fully understand them. And Aristophanes rose to prominence in the backdrop of the Peloponnesian War and this shift in politics from traditional aristocratic factions to the rise of the demagogues. The same rich citizens who sponsored the dramatic and comedic productions as Kragoi also would have served as Triarchoi for the navy. Most were loyal patriots who loved Athens, but many would have deplored the current war and most of the generals in charge of running it. In the Ecclesia, they were outnumbered by the masses and drowned out by the demagogues, but in the theater, they could get their messages across without interruption and Aristophanes composed plays that popularized the views of not only his, but of his sponsors. His comic genius was unique, but his values must have been agreeable to the community at large, as the decision whether to grant a chorus for training laid with the city magistrates. And of course, prizes were awarded by citizen judges, both of which were chosen by lot. Although Aristophanes' plays often express pride in the achievement of the older, aristocratic generation, or those who fought at Marathon, they are not jingoistic, and they are staunchly opposed to the war with Sparta. Behind the obscene and boisterous jokes about sex and other bodily functions, his plays also manifest a tender love of the countryside, a nostalgia for a simpler time, and a sober commitment to peace. The plays are particularly scathing of Cleon, who figure prominently in many of his merciless caricatures of war profiteers and demagogues. <laughs> 
When Aristophanes first made his entrance onto the comedic stage in 427 BC, Athens was an ambitious imperial power, and the Peloponnesian War was only in its fourth year. Just for context, the Mytilenean Revolt had not yet happened. In the spring of that year, Aristophanes won second prize at the city Dionysia with his first play, Ditales, or The Banqueteers, which unfortunately is now completely lost. He won first prize there the following year in 426 BC with his next play, Babylonioi, or The Babylonians, which is also now lost. However, we do have some contextual information. At the city Dionysia, it was usual for foreign dignitaries to attend, since the festival was held in the spring, when the seas were more navigable, but not so much at the Linnea, which took place in the winter, when the seas were very dangerous to sail upon. So clearly, if someone wanted to make the biggest political statements to non-Athenians, they had to do it at the city Dionysia, and this is exactly what Aristophanes did. The result was that the Babylonians caused quite a bit of embarrassment for the attending Athenian authorities, since it depicted the cities of the Delian League as slaves grinding at a mill. Again, for context, this was put on while the suppression of the Mytilenean Revolt was still ongoing. Some influential citizens, notably Cleon, condemned the play as slander against the Athenian state, and he may have possibly taken legal action against Aristophanes as he did with Lachis later that year. It's not entirely sure, though, because if he did, the details of the trial went unrecorded, or at least have been lost. But in his very next opportunity, at the Linnea, over the winter 426-425 BC, Aristophanes responded to Cleon's condemnation in his third play, called Acarnes, or the Acarnians, which is the oldest work to have survived of not only his, but the genre of old comedy altogether. Speaking through the play's protagonist, in a spirited response to Cleon, Aristophanes reveals his resolve not to yield to any sort of political intimidation, and he boldly proclaims that he will continue to criticize what he believes should be criticized. The Acarnians is also notable for its imaginative appeal for an end to the Peloponnesian War. At that point, the Athenians and Spartans were entering the sixth year of the war. The Spartans invaded Attica almost every year since the war started and burned, looted, and vandalized Attic farm property with unusual ferocity in order to provoke the Athenians into a land battle that they couldn't win. Every time, the Athenians remained behind their city walls until the enemy returned home, at which point they would march out to enact revenge on their pro-Spartan neighbors, the Megarians. It was a war of attrition that had brought daily hardships, starvation, and a plague that resulted in the deaths of thousands of Athenians, including Pericles. Yet, democratic Athens continued to be guided by the pro-war faction led by Cleon and exemplified by tough-minded militarists such as Lamachus. Although he was active as a general commanding unspecified expeditions in the northeast since the 430s BC, we haven't really come across Lamachus much, but he would become more prominent in the mid-420s BC and beyond. Anyways, in this atmosphere of suffering, Aristophanes aimed to use absurd humor in order to soothe their passions and to direct the people's rage against those who were responsible for the war. And so he essentially stepped forward as a public prosecutor in the comedic arena and attempted to increase his audience's disapproval of the corruption by Athens' slippery politicians and warmongers in office. In particular, the Acarnians ridicules the atmosphere of paranoia that Cleon stirred up with his alarmist speeches and denunciations of harmless foreigners. The protagonist of the play is an Athenian citizen named Dikiopolis, which literally means the just man of the city. He is a middle-aged, grumpy farmer from the deem of Acarnae, located to the north of Athens. The Peloponnesians had ravaged Acarnae annually during the war, but his anger wasn't directed at them, but rather at the Athenian politicians who were determined to continue the fighting. The play begins with Dikiopolis sitting alone on the Penix Hill, as he is the first to arrive for a meeting in the Ecclesia. He is frustrated, and he begins to vent his thoughts and feelings to the audience in which he reveals his weariness with the war, his longing to go home to his village, his impatience with the ecclesia for its failure to start on time, and his resolve to heckle speakers at this meeting who won't debate an end to the war. 
Then, some Athenian citizens finally arrive, all pushing and shoving to get the best seats. It is at this point that Digiopolis meets an Athenian man named Amphithius, who claims to be the immortal great-great-grandson of Triptolemus and Demeter, and that the gods have entrusted him alone among the Athenians with the duty of speaking diplomatically with the Spartans. Upon hearing this, the Scythian slaves, acting as police officers, seize Amphithius, presumably either believing that he is talking crazy or he is a Spartan spy. But Dicaeopolis convinces them that he means no harm, and so they release him. Then, the Median's agenda begins. A series of important speakers address the ecclesia, but the subject is not peace, and so true to his earlier promise, Dicaeopolis begins to heckle at all of the speakers by commenting loudly on their appearance and probable motives. The first to speak was an ambassador who, after many years, has just returned from the Persian court of Artaxerxes. He is complaining rather absurdly of the lavish hospitality that he has had to endure from his Persian hosts. Then, there is the Persian nobleman named Sutardabas, known as the Eye of the Great King, and he comically is sporting a gigantic eye and mumbling gibberish. He is also accompanied by two eunuchs, who turn out to be a disreputable pair of effeminate Athenians in disguise. Next is Theoros, the ambassador who recently returned from the Thracian court of King Satalkis. He blames the icy conditions in the north for his long stay there, which, after all, was at the public's expense. Lastly, there is the rabble of the supposed elite Thracian mercenaries, who are willing to fight for Athens, but they are very unwarlike in their appearance. The most striking feature of their costume is the circumcised phallus, and they hungrily steal Dicaeopolis' lunch. Much to Dicaeopolis' chagrin, though, peace is not discussed once. But during the middle of this scene, Amphithius claims that although the Athenian government is unwilling to negotiate a peace with the Spartans, he can obtain a private peace for individual Athenians. Dicaeopolis is skeptical, but he is so desperate that he accepts Amphithius' claims and pays him eight drachmas to bring him a private peace for him and his family, which in fact he manages to do. So after all the ambassadors have left, Amphithius appears back on stage, very much out of breath. He has three different samples of wine for Dicaeopolis to taste from, the ages of which each represent a different peace treaty. One is five years old, which Dicaeopolis says smells like the triremes that they are fitting out in the naval yard. The other is ten years old and smells like the delegates who go around the towns to chide their allies for their slowness. But the third and final bottle is 30 years old and smells like the aroma of nectar and ambrosia. Dicaeopolis eagerly accepts this treaty and drinks it in one gulp. In the next scene, Dicaeopolis celebrates his private peace with a private celebration of the royal Dionysia. It begins with a small parade outside his house in which he carries a pot in his hand, and he is followed by his wife, his daughter, who carries a basket, and two slaves, who carry the large statue of a phallus. For more information on the procession during the Dionysia festival, check out episode 49. Anyways, Dicaeopolis and his household are immediately attacked by a mob of elderly farmers and charcoal burners from Akarnai. These men are tough veterans of past wars, who hate the Spartans for destroying their farms, and who hate anyone willing to make peace with them. These men also make up the chorus and give the play its name, the Acarnians. They are not amenable to rational argument, though, so Dicaeopolis grabs a hostage and a sword and demands that the old men leave him alone. The hostage, though, is a basket of charcoal, which is very important to the Arcanians, because their primary source of revenue was the manufacturing and selling of charcoal. And so, since the old men have a sentimental spot for anything from Arcania, they agreed to leave Dicaeopolis alone as long as he spares the charcoal. Delighted, Dicaeopolis surrenders the hostage, but he now wants more than just to be left alone in peace. He desperately wants the old men to believe in the justice of his cause. He even says that he is willing to speak with his head on a chopping block so that they would hear him out, and yet he knows how unpredictable his fellow citizens can be, as he says that he hasn't forgotten how Cleon dragged him into court over last year's play. This mention of trouble with Cleon over a play indicates that Dicaeopolis is meant to represent Aristophanes, 
And since we know that Aristophanes sometimes acted roles in his plays, scholars have speculated that maybe the author was in fact the actor behind the mask here. Anyways, after gaining the chorus's permission for his anti-war speech, Dikiopolis decides that he needs someone special to help him craft it, and so he goes next door to the house of Euripides, a playwright renowned for his clever arguments. As it turns out, though, Dikiopolis only goes into his house to borrow a costume from one of Euripides' tragedies, a now-lost play titled Telephos, in which the hero disguises himself as a beggar. Euripides was apparently known for the lavish costumes that his characters wore. And so, dressed as a tragic hero, disguised as a beggar, and with his head on the chopping block, Dikiopolis explains his reasons for opposing the war to the chorus of Acarnian old men. He argues that the conflict started because of the abduction of three courtesans, and it is being continued by war profiteers for personal gain. Dikiopolis here explains the causes of the war in a manner that is partly comic and partly serious. His criticisms of Pericles and the Megarian Decree appear to be genuine, but he seems to be satirizing the historian Herodotus when he blames the war on the kidnapping of three courtesans, as Herodotus cites the kidnappings of Io, Europa, Medea, and Helen as the cause of the hostilities between the Greeks and those from Asia. The play also features another passage that alludes to the work of Herodotus during the aforementioned Athenian ambassador's account of his travels in Persia. According to tradition, Herodotus died sometime in the mid-420s BC, so it's possible that these comic allusions to his work may have been an homage to him post-mortem. Anyways, although half the chorus is won over by his argument, the other half isn't, and a fight breaks out between each side. And it only ends when the Athenian general Lamachus, who also happens to live next door, emerges from his house, armed from head to foot, and imposes himself in the action. Lamachus is able to restore order, but he is then questioned by Dikiopolis about the reason why he personally supports the war against Sparta. Is it out of his sense of duty, or because he is getting paid? Lamachus was an older man with a fiery disposition, and was fond of taking risks in battle. He was also so poor that during the campaigns in which he served as a general, he would charge the Athenian people money for his own clothes and boots. Although Lamachus was known for his courage and military skill, he was sometimes thought less qualified than other generals since he lacked the necessary wealth and social position. With this in mind, the chorus is won over by the arguments of Dikiopolis that because of his lack of wealth, Lamachus is prolonging the war so that he can make money. The haughty general then storms off back into his own house, and with his private peace and victory in hand, so does Dikiopolis. A parabasis then follows, in which all the actors have left the stage and the chorus addresses the audience directly. They lavish exaggerated praise upon the author, and lament the ill treatment that old men like themselves are suffering at the hands of slick litigators in these desperate times. Dikiopolis then returns to the stage and sets up a private market where he alone and the enemies of Athens can trade peacefully. Various minor characters come and go in farcical circumstances. First, a starving Megarian trades his famished daughters, disguised as piglets, for garlic and salt, products in which Megara had in large quantities in pre-war days, and then a sycophant, or informer, presumably of Cleon, tries to confiscate the piglets as enemy contraband, but he is driven off by Dikiopolis. Next, a Boeotian merchant arrives with a large assortment of birds, fish, and small mammals for sale from Lake Copes, all carried by his slave. Dikiopolis has nothing to trade that the Boeotian wants in return, but he cleverly manages to interest him in a commodity that is rare in Boeotia, an Athenian sycophant. Because it just so happens that another of Cleon's informers, a man named Nicarchus, has arrived at that very moment, and he tries to confiscate the birds and eels from the Boeotian merchant, but instead he is struck on the head, bounded and gagged by Dikiopolis. He is then packed in hay like a piece of pottery, and carried off back home by the Boeotian merchant's slave. Some other visitors come and go, and then two heralds arrive, one calling Lamachus off to war, and the other calling Dikiopolis to a dinner party. The two men go as summoned, and return soon thereafter. 
Lamachus is in pain from injuries that he sustained in battle, and he has a soldier at each arm propping him up, while Dickiopolis is merrily drunk with exquisite dancing girls on each arm. Dickiopolis clamors cheerfully for a wineskin, a prize that was awarded to him in a drinking competition, and the play ends as everyone exits in general celebration, except Lamachus, who exits in pain. The point being that war brings pain and suffering, while peace brings joy and celebration. As we have seen, the Spartans were the dominant land power on the Greek mainland, and consequently, the Athenians were reluctant to venture on foot far from the safety of their own city walls. Most Athenians had lived in rural settlements up until the war, and so the Acarnians reflects their reluctant transition from rural to urban life. While sitting on the Penix Hill, Dikiopolis gazes longingly at the countryside and expresses his wish to return to his village. Similarly, as the old Acarnians sing lovingly of their farms, they express hatred of the enemy for destroying their vines, and they regard the Athenian agora as a place crowded with people, so it is best to be avoided. Athens was the dominant maritime power in the Mediterranean, though, and its citizens could travel by sea with relative ease. And so the ambassadors who return from Persia and Thrace are resented by Dikiopolis because he has been living roughly in the unsanitary urban conditions of a packed Athens while they have been enjoying themselves abroad. Privileged individuals are able to get out of the city of Athens when times become difficult. And in this, Aristophanes likens them to piss pots that are emptied from an urban household. And so, the real enemies are not the Megarian and Boeotian farmers, with whom Dickiopolis is happy to trade, nor even the Spartans, who in his mind acted to protect their Megarian allies, but those Athenians who have forced Dickiopolis into an overcrowded urban existence. Using the main character Dickiopolis as his mouthpiece, Aristophanes here subsequently presents his anti-war argument with his head on a chopping block, a humorous reference to the danger that the satirist puts himself in when he questions the motives of influential men like Cleon. Responding to Cleon's public prosecution of him, Aristophanes assures the audience that the target of his ire is not the polis by saying, quote, People among us, and I don't mean the polis, remember this, I don't mean the polis, but wicked little men of a counterfeit kind, end quote. Though he was subtly shooting back at Cleon here, he would carve him up more fully the following year in his next play, The Knights, which we will cover later in this episode. Aristophanes, through Dickiopolis, longed for peace, and Athens' best attempt at peace so far would come the following campaign season in the war's sixth year, on the heels of a daring strategy in the Peloponnese the third geographical area where the Athenians went further than Periclean strategy seems to have dictated. Although Pericles sent several expeditions for seaborne raids on the Peloponnese, he never envisioned an attack on the interior of the Peloponnese itself. This type of daring, though, was yearned for by his successors, particularly Demosthenes, who conceived a plan that worked so well that it dramatically altered the balance of the war and almost brought it to an end. However, at the outset, he did not share his plan openly in the Ecclesia, as its execution depended upon secrecy and surprise, which would be difficult to achieve if all Athenian citizens knew about it. Although he was elected for the generalship for 425 BC, it was not yet his time to take command, as the Athenian New Year began in midsummer. And so, that spring, he accompanied a fleet sent from Athens to Sicily as a private citizen in an advisory role. If you remember from last episode, over the winter, Pythodorus had been sent ahead to relieve Lachis of his command with the anticipation that during the spring, a fleet of 40 triremes would be dispatched, commanded by Eurymedon and Sophocles, not the playwright, to reinforce his position in Sicily. Well, this is that fleet. These reinforcements became even more necessary because despite Athenian successes in Sicily and southern Italy the previous year, In the early spring of 425 BC, the Syracusans and the Locrians had regrouped, and Messana, which was under Athenian control, had revolted. In doing so, ten Syracusan and ten Locrian vessels each sailed against Messana, upon the invitation of its inhabitants, and they managed to recapture the city without much difficulty. This was part of a two-pronged attack, 
and at the same time, the Locrians invaded the territory of Regium with all of their ground forces. Regium, which sat opposite of Misano on the toe of southern Italy, was the Athenian base for operations and a major ally in that region, so attacking them was meant to distract and prevent them from assisting Misano, while the Syracusan and Locrian navy captured it. They never intended, nor did they have the necessary troops to take Regium. So after devastating the countryside, the Locrian land forces went home. Then, the Syracusan and Locrian ships held guard over the Straits of Messana in case of an Athenian counterattack. This was the situation in Sicily at the start of the campaign season of 425 BC. But the news had not reached Athens before the fleet sailed, so it proceeded ignorantly and without haste. At the same time, the Athenian general Simonides, who was operating in the Thracian region, got together a few Athenians from the garrisons and a number of allies in those parts and took by treachery the Mendaean colony of Eon in Thrace, which at that point was hostile to Athens. Almost immediately, though, the Halkidians and Batians came over and retook the city, with the loss of many Athenian soldiers in the fighting. Nothing else significant took place in the northeast for the rest of the campaign season of 425 BC, but the northwest was a different story, as the Corsairian civil war was still raging on. When Eurymedon had sailed away from there the previous year, after allowing the Democrats to slaughter their oligarchic opponents, 500 of the Corsairine oligarchs had managed to escape to the mainland, where they occupied forts, which they used as a base for attacking the island. Their raids caused a famine in the city, and after they unsuccessfully sent to Corinth and Sparta for additional help in retaking control of Corsaira, they finally hired mercenaries on their own from their neighboring non-Greek tribes. This combined force landed on Corsaira, burned their boats as evidence of their determination to stay until they were victorious, and fortified Mount Estone, which they used as a base for attacking the countryside. This success finally encouraged the Peloponnesians to send 60 ships to help them take back the island, as they believed that the famine raging in the city would make it easier for them to reduce it, and so the people would hand control of it back over to the pro-Peloponnesian oligarchs. The Athenians, though, were unaware of the Peloponnesian incursion, and so after hearing reports about what was transpiring in Corsaira, while also not getting up-to-date intelligence about Sicily, Many believed that saving Corsaira was a far more valuable use of the fleet rather than campaigning in the west. And so, despite the fact that Sophocles and Eurymedon had officially been given orders to sail to Sicily, they were also instructed first to sail to Corsaira in order to provide aid to the Democrats. They were also told to allow Demosthenes to use the ships around the Peloponnese as he wished, which they presumably believed would be standard raids of the coastline. But once the fleet had reached the coast of Laconia, the Athenian generals finally received news that a Peloponnesian fleet was on its way to Corsaira. And so, Sophocles and Eurymedon were eager to hasten there, but Demosthenes had other ideas. In his account of what happened next, Thucydides seems to exaggerate the element of chance and to minimize the element of planning, but it's likely that it was some combination of both. Since he had received permission to use the ships around the Peloponnese as he wished, with essentially no limitations, Demosthenes wanted to land the fleet on the Mycenaean coastline just long enough to build fortifications, leave a force behind to defend it, and then sail on to Corsaira. That's because he believed that a successful landing on the Mycenaean coast would therefore compel the withdrawal of the Peloponnesian fleet from Corsaira. Sophocles and Eurymedon, though, were unconvinced. But as luck should have it, a storm, which was not uncommon during this time around the Peloponnese, forced the Athenians to land at the promontory of Pylos on the southwestern coast of the Peloponnese, which was likely the place or near the place that Demosthenes had envisioned all along. Pylos sat about 45 miles or 70 kilometers from Sparta, and the Spartans called it Corypheasium. This was the perfect location for him to hatch his plan, and it's likely that Demosthenes made note of this area on previous voyages and even consulted with his Mycenaean friends at Naupactus about it. As the generals waited for the storm to abate, Demosthenes went over their heads and appealed directly to the soldiers for their support in his grand plan. 
He initially was unsuccessful, but as the storm dragged on, the soldiers grew bored, and so they finally agreed to do what he had asked. With the soldiers backing now, his reluctant co-generals, Sophocles and Eurymedon, were forced to allow Demosthenes to execute his plan. Although they didn't know it, they just signed off on the execution of a plan upon which the course of the war would turn in Athens's favor and would have reverberating consequences. Demosthenes wished to fortify the port and establish a garrison fort, called an Epitychismos, at Pylos, that would give Athens a strong base close to Sparta. The surrounding territory was deserted, and its natural landscape had great utility for the war at sea, because together with the narrow island of Sphacteria, the promontory of Pylos enclosed a body of water known today as the Bay of Navarino, which was the largest safe harbor on that side of the Peloponnese. This was not the first time that the Athenians had done this sort of thing during the war, as Nicias had established an epitychismos on the island of Manoa in the Saronic Gulf just two years earlier, which we mentioned last episode. But the skeptical reaction of these two generals to this idea strongly suggests that doing so on the Peloponnesian coastline was never a part of Pericles' original strategy, and was purely Demosthenes' idea. From this fort, the Athenians could launch raids at will on Spartan territory. More importantly though, the entire Spartan system depended on the Helots who tended the fields of Messenia, while its citizens trained to become soldiers. And now the establishment of a hostile fort in their backyard could act as an asylum for escaping Helots. After receiving their orders from Demosthenes, the Athenian soldiers hastened to fortify a hilltop on the southern end of the promontory of Pylos that overlooked the northern end of the Bay of Navarino, which faced directly across from the island of Sphacteria. Since they didn't have masonry tools, called lithorga, for the cutting and shaping of the stone, they collected rough field stones for the walls and put them together as they fit it together. When mortar was needed, they brought in clay on their backs from the interior. They also fortified a strip of beach to serve as a landing place for receiving supplies or reinforcements from friendly ships. They did all of this quickly and managed to finish in just six days so that the fort would be up before the Spartan army could appear. Sparta was only 60 miles or 90 kilometers away, which presumably would only take a few days for them to travel at a quickened pace once they became aware and assembled. When the storm finally let up, Sophocles and Eurymedon left Demosthenes behind with a small force of men and five triremes in order to defend the newly established fort, and then they sailed northwards to Corsaira. This force consisted of the crew for the five triremes, as well as 40 Mycenaean hoplites coming from Naupactus that just happened to sail past Pylos and see the Athenian ships. Their opportune arrival does not seem to be coincidental, which gives credence to the theory that Demosthenes had envisioned this location all along, and had made prearranged plans. In any case, he intended for these Mycenaeans to fight as insurgents, who could blend in with the Helots in the countryside and spread terror among Mycenae. At the time, the Spartans were celebrating an unspecified festival, and Aegis was leading their army in Attica, where they were invading for the fifth consecutive season. But when news reached them of what the Athenians were up to at Pylos, the fear of a potential general revolt of Helots, emboldened by the nearby Athenian presence, drove the Spartans to immediate action. The panic Spartans withdrew their army from Attica after just 15 days, the shortest invasion by far, and they amended the orders of the Spartan navarch, Thrasymelidas, who was leading the fleet to Corsaira. And so he turned his ships around, slipped past the Athenian fleet that was heading northbound, and sailed towards the vicinity of Pylos. An advanced guard of some of the Spartiates who had not gone to Attica, and the Perioikoi, who lived closest to Pylos, were sent forth under Brasidas to link up with Thrasymelidas and his forces for an attack on the Athenian stronghold. After establishing camp on the eastern coast of the Bay of Navarino, the Spartans ferried 420 hoplites, including 120 Spartiates, as well as their helot attendants, to the nearby tiny island of Sphacteria, which was just three miles long and was situated south of Pylos, closing off the bay from the open sea. These troops, under the command of Epitatus, did not set up a formal military outpost, though, 
but instead they hid themselves amongst the dense shrub and rock crevices of the island. Tasked with the special operations mission of denying a landing place to the Athenian fleet. The northern entrance into the bay was so small that only two ships at a time could sail through it, while the southern entrance was much larger, supposedly a width of about eight or nine ships. And so, if the Spartans failed to take Pylos, they planned to block these entrances before the Athenian reinforcements arrived. Thucydides' description of the Pylos campaign continues to be the subject of much debate, as scholars have not even reached a consensus on such basic elements as the location of the harbor at the site. Most have identified Thucydides' harbor as the entire Bay of Navarino, despite general recognition that it is much too large for an ancient harbor, and that its width and deep southern entrance could not have been blocked by Peloponnesian triremes. And so, some scholars have chosen to select a location within the bay as the harbor. For the purposes of this episode, though, we will assume the harbor is the entire Bay of Navarino, but do recognize that there is some ambiguity here. Anyways, as the Spartan forces were gathering, Demosthenes pulled three of his five triremes up onto the beaches in order to protect them from being destroyed by the Peloponnesian fleet, and then he armed their crews of about a thousand men, 200 from each trireme with whatever weapons were at hand. On board these ships was probably only about 50 hoplites, 10 each from the five triremes. Since he was unable to procure the necessary conventional hoplite equipment in this hostile and relatively deserted land, the non-hoplites would only be equipped with wicker shields. However, the Mycenaean ship that had arrived so serendipitously with their 40 hoplites, also just so happened to be carrying additional weapons that were distributed to the non-Athenian hoplites. And so, it seems more and more likely that Demosthenes had arranged this attack in advance. Still, the Athenian force was badly outnumbered and inferior in armament, and so he sent the two of the five triremes that he didn't beach to intercept Sophocles and Eurymedon and inform them of their impending situation. These two ships found the fleet at Xanthos, and upon receiving the dire message, together they hurried back to Pylos as fast as possible. Unfortunately, though, the Spartans would attack long before they managed to arrive. Although the Spartans had little doubt they would be able to take the hastily built Athenian fort, they also suspected that the Athenian fleet must have been in the vicinity. And so, once they saw the two Athenian ships sail away to deliver the message to Sophocles and Eurymedon, they planned accordingly to launch an immediate attack on Pylos by land and sea. Demosthenes too had envisioned this, and in particular, he suspected, correctly, that the Spartans would choose to launch an amphibious assault against the southwest corner of the promontory, where their defensive wall was at its weakest, and the land was the most suitable for a forced landing. And so he outmaneuvered the Spartan generals, Thrasymelodos and Brasidas, by moving himself and 60 hand-picked Athenian and Mycenaean hoplites, as well as a few archers, to the rocky beach in the southwest to prevent the Spartans from landing there, while the rest of his force prepared to defend the newly fortified fort. In his speech before the so-called Battle of Pylos, Demosthenes advised his troops to offer firm resistance on the beach in order to repulse the enemy's amphibious assault. At one point, he shared with them a simple truth about ancient amphibious warfare. Quote, It is impossible to force a landing from ships against an enemy on shore if he stands his ground and does not give way through fear. End quote. And so, encouraged by Demosthenes, the Athenians posted themselves along the edge of the sea and awaited the Spartan attack. When it finally came, the Spartans simultaneously assaulted the fortification by land and by sea, and their ships attacked precisely where Demosthenes had expected. However, although the landing of all 43 Peloponnesian ships would surely have overwhelmed the small Athenian force, the submerged rocks in the bay prevented such a mass assault. In the face of this natural barricade, the Peloponnesians had to divide up their fleet into small detachments. And so, while the main fleet waited behind, a few triremes at a time tried to thread their way through the reefs and force a landing. This was quite a hazardous strategy, so the whole operation proceeded slowly. Eventually, many of the Peloponnesians began to grow impatient, particularly Brasidas, 
He currently was serving as a trierarch, or captain of a trireme, and was still smarting from his naval encounter with Formio four years earlier. So he began to shout that it was shameful for them to care more about saving their ships than destroying the Athenians. And then he ordered his own steersmen to drive the trireme ashore as fast as possible, regardless of the damage it might cause, so that his men could disembark and drive the Athenians back. As soon as he jumped ashore, though, an Athenian arrow struck him in an unspecified part of his body, and he collapsed backwards into his own trireme. As he fell, his large, round hoplite shield also fell over the side of the ship and into the sea. In the process, he lost a lot of blood and faded into unconsciousness. At once, the Peloponnesian oarsmen pulled away from the beach. Once they rejoined the rest of the fleet, Brasidas was carried off half-dead from the ship by his men. He would live to fight another day, though, and his bravery would bring even more glory upon himself. Despite the fact that most Spartan men who lost their shields during battle were punished with death, because it normally indicated that you had thrown your large and heavy shield away in order to retreat and outrun pursuing enemy light infantry and cavalry. Still, the Peloponnesian landing had lost its momentum, and it ultimately would be repulsed. That's mainly because, as Demosthenes alluded to in his pre-battle speech, the tactic of trying to land troops on a beach facing stiff hoplite resistance was known to be notoriously difficult during this time. And so all day, he and his small force of a few dozen men managed to defend the beach and keep the Peloponnesians' force of 8,000 soldiers and 43 ships in the bay. It must have seemed like the world had turned upside down, as a small Athenian land army was able to repulse a much larger Peloponnesian fleet at sea. Thucydides here too notes the irony of the Athenians defending Spartan land against Spartans attacking from the sea. By evening, the Peloponnesians had given up, and the tides brought Brasidas' shield onto the beach, which the Athenians gleefully set up as a victory trophy. At the same time, the Peloponnesian land forces trying to storm Pylos didn't have any success. And so, they were forced to settle in for a siege, and they dispatched several ships to Essene to collect wood for the building of siege engines. But after two days of siege preparations, the main Athenian fleet had arrived from Xanthos. It had grown to 50 triremes with the addition of a number of Chian ships and several from Naupactus. However, it was too late that day to initiate a naval attack, so the Athenian fleet anchored that night on the nearby island of Prote, which was about 8 miles or 12 kilometers north of Pylos up the coast. They chose this location as they had hoped to draw the Peloponnesian fleet out into the open sea for a battle on the following day. Not only did the Peloponnesian fleet decline to come out and fight in open water though, but they had failed to blockade the entrances to the harbor as they intended. And so, on the next morning, the Athenians split up their forces and each charged into the bay through the channels at both the northern and southern ends of Sphacteria, catching the Peloponnesians totally unprepared. Once inside the bay, they launched an immediate attack on the Peloponnesian ships and quickly routed them. Although pursuit was limited by the large size of the bay, they managed to capture five, one with its crew on board, and drove the rest onto the shore. The Athenians then began to ram some of them while at rest, and so the Spartans rushed to their rescue by dragging some of them on land and away from the Athenians. After the Athenians landed, a fierce fight ensued in which they were able to seize even more ships. Ultimately, the Athenians withdrew after heavy casualties had been suffered on both sides, and both parties then returned to their own camp. In total, the Athenians lost 8 ships, while the Spartans lost 18, an unknown number of which were captured. The ramifications and importance of this victory for Athens cannot be exaggerated. At the end of the battle, the Athenians controlled the bay and were able to sail freely around the island of Sphacteria. With the Spartan ships being chased off, the Athenians managed to trap the Spartan hoplites on Sphacteria with limited fresh water or provisions. To prevent an escape to the mainland, a pair of Athenian triremes kept up constant patrol by day, rowing around the island in opposite directions. At night, when the darkness made rowing dangerous, the entire Athenian fleet anchored in a large circle around the island. The Athenians did this because Demosthenes could sense the fortunate position that they had found themselves in. 
so limited was the number of Spartiates at that time, that when news of what had happened at Pylos reached Sparta, it was so serious that their government was thrown into a panic, and they were willing to do anything to get those hoplites back. At that time, the 120 Spartiates on the island probably comprised one-tenth of that elite class on which the Spartan government was based. Because, as we discussed in episode 23, Sparta was a state that practiced a strict code of eugenics and only married amongst other Spartiates, meaning that their total number of citizens was always very low and in fact was constantly dwindling. And so, an emergency like this necessitated an extreme response, and Spartan officials were sent at once to Pylos to decide on the spot what was best to be done. Seeing the impossibility of the situation that their men found themselves in, these Spartan envoys determined that it was necessary to negotiate an armistice with the Athenian generals. Both sides agreed that if either party infringed upon the stipulated terms, then the armistice was to be considered void immediately. As part of the arrangement, the Athenians would continue their blockade of Sphacteria, but swore not to land upon the island and attack their troops, and the Spartans swore not to attack the Athenian fort at Pylos. In addition, the entire Peloponnesian fleet was surrendered to the Athenians as a guarantee for Spartan good conduct. In return, the Spartans were permitted to take food to their men on the island, in the form of two quarts of barley meal, one pint of wine, and a piece of meat for each man, and half the same quantity of each for their helot attendants. This was not that much, though, as it was only just enough to get the men by until the Spartan envoys returned from Athens. That's because, in the case that no peace would be agreed upon, the Athenians didn't want the Spartiates to find themselves in a better situation than before in terms of provisions. Following the armistice, an Athenian trireme conveyed the Spartan envoys from Pylos to Athens in order to seek a permanent peace. When the negotiators reached Athens, a Spartan ambassador makes a speech before the ecclesia in which he expresses Sparta's wish to settle the war in a manner consistent with both Athenian interests in their current circumstances and Spartan dignity in its time of grave misfortune. He points out that the Athenians should take advantage of this unique opportunity that they have before them in order to make peace, and claims that although Athens has gained the upper hand now, it is not representative of any fundamental shift in the balance of power. That's because Sparta only suffered this misfortune, not through incapacity or overreaching, but through mere bad luck and their own errors of judgment. And so the Athenians should use their success wisely and moderately by seizing this opportunity to have peace with them on good terms. Because this type of opportunity will not come along again. He points out that real peace must arise through generosity from the side with the advantage, not through harsh retribution, which will only spawn a desire for revenge. Then the Spartan representative not only offers the ecclesia an immediate end to the war, but suggests that they sign a treaty for an offensive and defensive alliance in exchange for the men on the island of Sphacteria. He concludes by saying that Athens will receive full credit for peace and that it will endure, so long as both sides wish it to last, since no one state or coalition in Greece would be able to challenge the combined hegemony of Athens and Sparta. No mention of territorial adjustment is made, though, implying that Athens would get to keep control of Agina, Minoa, and their foothold in the northwest, while the Spartans would abandon Plataea as they had planned. This was a generous peace offer, and the Spartans no doubt were confident that the Athenians would accept their truce and give back their men, especially because just five years earlier, some Athenians secretly had sent ambassadors to Sparta to obtain peace, so there clearly was an appetite for peace within the city of Athens itself. On the surface, this might seem like the kind of peace that Pericles had envisioned at the beginning of the war, but Pericles' aims were largely psychological, as he wanted to irritate the Spartans so much that they would realize that they lacked the power to defeat Athens. This clearly wasn't the case here, as Athenian ascendancy was the result of circumstances that could be reversed at any time. It's likely that at least some Athenians realized that after regaining their hostages, Sparta could just resume the war at any time it pleased. Thucydides says that the Athenians demanded more, implying that greed, ambition, and the extension of their empire drove them. 
but any reasonable Athenian might have wanted a firmer guarantee to safeguard the volatility of Spartan internal politics that had helped bring on the conflict and might bring on a future one. Not surprisingly, the opposition to the Spartan peace offer was led by Cleon, who then addressed the envoys. His counterproposal probably wasn't a coincidence, as some of the terms that he stipulated were meant to rectify past Athenian grievances. First, the Spartans on Sphacteria must surrender themselves and their arms and be brought to Athens, and second, that the Peloponnesians must hand over the four strategic towns or territories that had been stripped of their Athenian garrisons 22 years earlier, at the end of the First Peloponnesian War. When the Athenians gave up their newly won land empire in exchange for a group of Athenian hostages, these would be Nicaea and Pegai, the two ports of Megara, Troezen, and Achaea. Only then would Athens hand over the prisoners and agree to an alliance, for however long as both parties might agree. And so Cleon's terms were a recognition that the Athenians had little to gain from a peace which surrendered the advantage that they had just won without impairing the Spartans' future ability to make war. And so, arguing that they might secure far better terms in the future by pressing their advantage, the Athenians took the advice of Cleon and voted to refuse the Spartan ambassador's peace offer, probably on account of their overconfidence at that moment. In response, the Spartans didn't reject Cleon's unwelcome additions outright, but requested that the Athenians appoint a small committee to negotiate the terms one by one, in a calm and orderly atmosphere in private, rather than in the emotionally charged ecclesia. This proposal, though, was violently denounced by Cleon, who pounced on the opportunity to further rile up the Athenian people. He proclaims that he knew from the start that the Spartans had evil intentions, and he would not let them veil it with secrecy, and so he demanded that they say whatever they had to say in public. At this, the Spartan envoys recognized that the Athenians would not negotiate moderately, and so they left the Ecclesia and went back to Pylos without a settlement. That's because the Spartans were unwilling to discuss out in the public any terms that would betray their allies, which is essentially what the Athenians were asking them to do if they were to cede any territory back to Athens. Furthermore, the suggestion that the Spartans would give up Megara's harbors to Athens was an unrealistic stipulation, as that would have placed Athens directly on the Isthmus, from where they could cut Sparta off from Boeotia and central Greece. And so, the Athenians had to have known that the Spartans would be unwilling to agree to their terms, and that essentially they were voting to continue on the war and to try and press their advantage further. It's interesting to think how Aristophanes might have reacted to this rejection of peace if his aforementioned play The Acarnians was put on the winter after the Battle of Pylos rather than the winter before. In the wake of the failed peace negotiations, the moment that the Spartan envoys arrived back at Pylos, the armistice officially came to an end. But according to the agreed-upon terms, when the Spartans asked for the return of their ships, the Athenians refused to hand them over alleging that they had violated the terms of the armistice by attacking their wall, as well as other grievances, which Thucydides says were not worth mentioning. Clearly, they didn't have good reason for their actions here. After denying the violation and protesting against Athens' bad faith in their armistice, the Spartans then marched their army angrily back to Sparta. Henceforth, without a fleet of their own, they would be forced to fight only on land, which may not have been that great of a handicap, though in view of the ineffectiveness of their navy up to that point. Then, both sides settled in for the eventual fight over the fate of the Spartans on Sphacteria. The Athenians were now fully committed to capturing the men, and so the Ecclesia voted to send an additional 20 ships to enforce the blockade. The Athenian people had expected a quick capitulation, as Sphacteria was a desert island with no food and little drinkable water, and their fleet had complete control of all approaches to it. Naturally then, Demosthenes tried to starve them out, but the Athenian fleet was unable to blockade the island tightly enough, despite the fact that they guarded the island night and day against attempts at rescue or resupply. Eventually, it became clear that the Spartans would be able to hold out for longer than anticipated. That's because while the Spartan government had begun to muster more troops for a second attack on Pylos, they also looked for unique ways to provision their men on Sphacteria. In the end, they were able to bring in a small but critical stream of food by offering monetary rewards to those free men who they recruited as divers to swim across the bay with goat skins packed with honey, poppy seed, and linseed. 
At first, these divers escaped unnoticed, but once they were discovered, a lookout was then kept for them, making it much more difficult for them to complete their task. In addition, on stormy and windy nights, when Athenian triremes stayed in the bay, seafaring helots risked their lives for the promise of their freedom by landing boatloads of flour, cheese, wine, and other food on the island's seaward or western side. And so, because of these efforts, the trapped Spartans managed to survive for a total of 72 days. Because of this, the Athenians began to find themselves also short on rations, as their entire force of about 14,000 men was forced to depend on a single spring on the Acropolis of Pylos for their fresh water. This was small though, so at the same time many were forced to scrape away from the gravel on the beach and drink whatever water there that they could find. They also were encamped within very small spaces at Pylos, and so many of the soldiers stayed on the triremes for more room. But they had to rotate between those who took their meals ashore and those who anchored at sea, since a trireme had no space for the preparation of food. However, their greatest decline in morale came from the unexpected length of the siege, which they thought would only take a few days. Back in Athens, after they learned of the alarming state of affairs for their army at Pylos, the Athenians grew greatly concerned. Even during the summer, the shipping of the necessary supplies around the Peloponnese was a long and expensive process, but the approach of winter and its accompanying storms around the tip of the Peloponnese would make it almost impossible for them to bring provisions to their suffering fellow citizens. Therefore, unless the impasse was swiftly broken, winter would necessitate the abandonment of the blockade, which would allow the men on Sphacteria to be able to escape and the rejection of Sparta's peace offer would have been a serious miscalculation. This negative turn of fortunes was the source of much concern at Athens, and their decision to reject Sparta's peace offer became a source of regret for many Athenians. What caused even more alarm than their weakening position was their belief that the Spartans, conversely, must have felt themselves on stronger ground, since they hadn't felt the need to send any more envoys after the first were rejected. And so there was a turn of popular opinion, and many openly began to blame Cleon. This dissatisfaction eventually boiled over at one session of the Ecclesia. It's likely that this meeting was meant to discuss a request by Demosthenes to send further reinforcements, specifically the type of specially trained troops that he would need to take the island, such as archers and javelin throwers, who would be able to fight more effectively on the rough terrain of Sphacteria than the heavily armed hoplites. It's also likely that Demosthenes and Cleon had been in close communication, and so he already knew of his plan to take the island. Cleon was a natural choice to serve as Demosthenes' advocate back in Athens, as it would be Cleon, since he was the most outspoken proponent of rejecting the Spartan peace offer, who would likely be the one held the most accountable if Demosthenes failed to prevent the men on Sphacteria from escaping. It's also likely that by that point, the moderate-tempered Nicias, a political opponent of his and one of the ten strategoi for that year, had come to favor a negotiated peace with Sparta, since Athens currently had the upper hand. And so he surely would have opposed any requests for reinforcements to launch an assault on the island, which he would have seen as an unnecessary risk that should be avoided. Nicias' base of support laid with Athens' richer and more conservative voters, the sort of men who despised Cleon. So when Cleon, who was now feeling the displeasure of his fellow citizens, claimed that the reports brought back from Pylos must be inaccurate, Nicias retorted by proposing to send a commission, with Cleon among its members, to verify the accuracy of the reports. Cleon, though, couldn't help himself, likely because he knew what that commission would find. So in response, he pointed his finger at Nicias and attacked him for proposing to waste time that should have been spent attacking the Spartans. He then began to make disparaging remarks about Nicias' unwillingness to capture them, by saying that if Nicias wasn't such a coward, he easily would be able to capture the troops on the island, and it would be on the account of his weakness if the men on the island escaped. Following this, Cleon, who had no prior experience leading troops into battle, boasted that he could put an end to the whole affair if only he was given military command. Acting with uncharacteristic decisiveness, Nicias then called his bluff and promptly suggested that he would temporarily surrender his generalship to Cleon so that he could go to Pylos with whatever force he chose in order to get the stranded hoplites himself, since Cleon thought it would be so easy. <laughs> 
Although Nicias had no legal authority to make this offer, those in the ecclesia found themselves caught up in the enthusiasm of the moment, and so they greeted his proposal with a thunderous applause. Once Cleon realized that Nicias' offer was more than just a rhetorical ploy, he attempted to back down from this challenge, confused by the unexpectedness of the offer, and scared of what he might have just gotten himself into. Therefore, Nicias repeated the offer, hoping both to thoroughly humiliate and discredit him if he chose to be a coward after railing against Nicias for being one. The crowd, though, made sure that Cleon couldn't back down, as many joined together in chanting his name, some in earnest, others from hostility to Cleon, and others for the sheer fun of egging him on. And so, realizing that he wouldn't be able to escape the consequences of his own brashness, Cleon was compelled to accept Nicias' command. Afterwards, he reassumed the bold attitude that he had taken at the start of the debate by promising that he would be back within 20 days, with the hostages either in hand or with news of their destruction. This braggadocious behavior by Cleon probably was only possible because he already knew that a quick decision one way or another was bound to happen, since Demosthenes was already planning for an attack on Sphacteria at the moment when reinforcements arrived at Pylos. Cleon then sent word to Demosthenes that help was on the way, as he prepared to sail out from Athens with a reinforcement force of Lemnian and Imbrian hoplite troops who happened to be present in the city, some allied peltasts, and 400 archers. Many Athenians watched the fleet depart with amusement, sure that Cleon would return either dead or permanently discredited. Either way, they would be rid of him. If, for some reason, he managed to succeed, then they would have reduced Spartan power so it was a win-win situation all around. Fortunately for Cleon, though, against the expectations of Nicias and the upper-class Athenians, he worked well with Demosthenes, who was already planning for an invasion of Spacteria, as the difficulty of the circumstances that his men were in had led him to doubt the viability of a prolonged siege. In addition to requesting aid from Athens, Demosthenes had also sent for additional troops from his allies in the vicinity. He had learned from his past mistakes the previous year, engaging in guerrilla warfare in Aetolia, and so the usually brash general was cautious about attacking an island that was densely populated with forestry, without knowing the lay of the land first. But as it would so happen, a forest fire on the island, ignited by Athenian sailors, sneaking across to Sphacteria, in order to cook a meal away from the crowded confines of Pylos, had stripped the island of its vegetation which allowed Demosthenes to examine both the contours of the island and the number and disposition of its Spartan defenders. In doing so, one of the great tactical advantages of the enemy was removed by the fire, as he was now no longer worried that he might be attacked from an unseen position, while traversing the island's wooded areas. Also, with the woods now gone, he was able to see how numerous the Spartans really were, and to notice places where he could make a safe landing that had been obscured before. In particular, he saw that only 30 Spartans were detailed to guard the southern end of the island, facing away from Pylos, while most of their forces were near the island's center and northern tip. With this information, he was able to formulate a plan to capture the Spartans. All he had to do now was wait for his reinforcements. On the day that Cleon arrived, a herald first was sent to the Spartans on the mainland to ask them once again if they wished to surrender themselves. On the rejection of this proposition, the two generals then put Demosthenes' plan into motion. On the next evening, just before dawn, Demosthenes and 800 Athenian hoplites landed at the two weakest defended points, on both the western and eastern sides of the island's southern part. The Spartan garrison of 30 hoplites detailed there thought that the Athenian ships were only mooring in their usual nightly watch posts, and so they didn't react to Demosthenes' movements. And so, after the Athenian forces landed and stealthily made their way to their location, they were caught off guard while still in their beds and were swiftly massacred. At dawn, the remainder of the Athenian force, except for a small defense force left behind as a garrison at Pylos, landed on the southern tip of Sphacteria. These included around 2,000 light-armed troops, 800 archers, and about 8,000 rowers from the fleet that was now about 70 ships all armed with whatever weapons that they were able to find. They overwhelmed the Spartans' beachfront defenses and moved inland to link up with Demosthenes and his 800 Athenian hoplites. Once together, he divided his non-hoplite troops into companies of around 200 men and sent some of them off to seize all of the high places on the island. 
so that wherever the Spartans decided to defend themselves against the Athenian attack, they would be surrounded by enemy light-armed troops, harassing them from above with missile fire. After the Spartan commander, Epitatus, realized that the Athenians had landed on the island, had cut down their outpost, and were advancing against them in full force, he quickly formed up his men in a phalanx and advanced to meet them in battle. When the Spartans located the Athenians' position, they charged at them in full speed, but Athens' light-armed troops, which were on their flanks and high above, kept them at bay with their missiles. Although the Spartans routed any light-armed troops who happened to approach too closely, most only popped off a few shots and then retreated, and since they were lightly equipped, they were able to get away, whereas the Spartans in heavy armor were encumbered and were not able to catch up to them. This cat-and-mouse game lasted for some time, and as Demosthenes' tactics thwarted and demoralized the Spartans, the Athenians grew more confident. After the Spartans had become physically worn down from pursuing them, the Athenians charged out once again, firing missiles from a distance with loud shouts. While being pelted from all sides with stones, darts, and arrows, the unexpected clamor began to unnerve the Spartans, who were unable to hear the words of their commander. Dust and ash from the recent fire, stirred up by the commotion, further contributed to the Spartans' predicament by obscuring their attackers from their sight. And so, blinded by dust and deafened by the noise of battle, the Spartans were unable to make any headway and withdrew in some confusion to the northern end of the island, where they dug in behind their fortifications and hoped to hold out. A few Spartan hoplites were mowed down in retreat by the swifter, light-armed troops of the Athenians, but most managed to get behind their fortifications in time. It was probably mid-morning at this point, and for the rest of the day, a stalemate took hold. With both sides suffering from the misery of battle, thirst, and the heat, the Athenians tried unsuccessfully to dislodge the Spartans from their strong positions. At one point, the commander of the Mycenaean detachment in the Athenian force, named Comon, approached Demosthenes and Cleon and asked that he be allowed to take his troops through the seemingly impassable terrain along the island's northern shore, which would bring them around to the enemy's rear. His request was granted, and Comon led his men out of sight and around the Spartan rear through a route that had been left unguarded because of the roughness of its terrain. After all, the Spartans had very little numbers to begin with, so they didn't waste them on a route that they thought was unassailable. However, Comon and his small expeditionary force achieved the unachievable and emerged on the rear high ground. In the shock of seeing the enemy now behind them, the Spartans abandoned their defenses. After the Athenians used this opportunity to seize the approaches to the fort, the Spartans were now surrounded, and the weakened, hungry, and surrounded Spartan force stood on the brink of annihilation. At this point, Cleon and Demosthenes declined to push the attack further, preferring to take as many Spartans alive as they could as prisoners back to Athens. An Athenian herald thus was sent to the Spartans and offered them a chance to surrender. After mulling it over, the Spartans agreed to a parley by throwing down their shields and waving their hands. Cleon and Demosthenes then met with the current Spartan commander Stiphon, who had initially been the third in command, but Epitades had been killed, and his second in command, Hippogretus, was severely wounded and had been left for dead. Stiphon requested that he be able to send a herald to the mainland to seek advice from Sparta, as he did not want to be the one held responsible for any capitulation. The Athenian commanders agreed to this. However, although they refused to allow any of the trapped men to leave, they permitted as many heralds as were desired to pass back and forth from the mainland. And so, several carried messages back two or three times, the last of whom left Stiphon with a message, quote, the Spartans order you to make your decision yourselves, so long as you do nothing dishonorable. End quote. After consulting with his other officers, Stiphon and his men, with no hope of victory or escape, chose to surrender themselves in their arms. It was almost nighttime, so the Athenians held guard over them until morning. They then set up a victory trophy, and the prisoners were given over to the Trearchs to be guarded on their journey to Athens. After the Athenian fleet sailed back to Athens, a herald was sent to Sparta giving them permission to take up their dead. Of the 420 Spartan hoplites who had crossed over to Sphacteria, 292 survived and were taken alive to Athens. Of these, 120 were men of the elite Spartiate class. In total, 128 Spartans were killed. Thucydides doesn't give numbers, but says that the Athenian loss was negligible. <laughs> 
the Athenian blockade of Sphacteria was now over after lasting for 72 days. As Cleon had promised, he was able to capture the blockaded Spartans and transport them to Athens as prisoners before the 20th day had passed. And in the wake of this, he would reach the pinnacle of his fame, as he no longer was a politician with no military successes. Although most of the credit was probably due to the military genius of his colleague Demosthenes, it was thanks to Cleon's determination that the Ecclesia even sent out the additional force that was needed. So he still had a major role. The outcome, no doubt, shook the Greek world, as this was the first time in their collective memory that the Spartans had chosen a surrender rather than fight to the death. Although this is untrue, as the Spartans had surrendered at least once before to the Tegeans, as we discussed in episode 22. Still, Thucydides says that nothing else whatsoever that happened during the war surprised the Greeks as much as this did, because it was the general opinion that no force or famine could make the Spartans give up their arms, but that they would fight on for as long as they could until they died with them in their hands. It was such an incredulous situation that rumors even began to spread that there was no way that these men were true-blooded Spartans. However, the Spartan government's reaction both before and especially after their capture clearly indicates that they were men of the purest lineage, since this immediately put a halt to the conflict, as true-blooded Spartiates were very valuable to Sparta, and their capture gave the Athenians a bargaining chip. And so, the desperate Spartans immediately sent envoys once again to propose a peace for their return, but the Athenians refused envoy after envoy, once again following Cleon's lead. It's likely that if Pericles had still been alive, the Athenians would have entertained the envoys and likely would have taken their peace offer here. But the ultra-aggressive Cleon had managed to persuade the Athenian people once again to hold out for an even sweeter deal. And so the 120 Spartiates were to be held indefinitely in Athens as hostages. This was probably a mistake though, because any peace that Sparta made in order to regain its men was for selfish reasons, as it would no doubt involve ceding the territory that Cleon had requested earlier, and doing so was likely to alienate Sparta's allies and foster the beginning of a potential disintegration of the Peloponnesian League. This is just another example of Cleon not having very much foresight or long-term strategic thinking. Regardless, the capture of Sphacteria radically shifted the balance of power in the war. At the behest of Cleon, the Athenians chose to hold the Spartiates captive indefinitely, so that they could threaten to execute all of their new Spartan prisoners if Sparta were to invade Attica ever again. As a result, the annual invasions of Attica were immediately halted, and the Athenians could farm their crops securely now. This was great news to many Athenians, who were excited to leave the crowded Athens for their own homes. In addition, some of the Messenians from Naupactus were sent back to their old country and garrisoned at Pylos. These men still spoke the Messenian dialect, which means that they would be able to go about the countryside undetected. And so, the Athenians now had a valuable stronghold in Spartan territory that was manned by local allies, and from where they could launch raids and instigate the desertion of numerous helots. Having tied the hands of their enemy, the overconfident Athenians began to celebrate their victory and the great fortune that they now found themselves in. The most prized war trophies from Pylos were the hundreds of bronze shields taken from the defeated Spartans, including that of Brasidas, and these were offered as a dedication in all of the sanctuaries in Athens, with each shield displaying the proud inscription, Athenaeoi Apo Lacaidemonion Ek Pylo, or the Athenians from the Lacaidemonians on Pylos. A particular bronze shield with this inscription has been found during the excavations in the Athenian Agora, presumably dedicated to one of the sanctuaries there. Thucydides disapproved of these successes, likely because it was achieved by Cleon, whom he disliked, and Demosthenes, of whom his approval is muted, and it involved the rejection of Spartan peace offers, which he probably thought should have been accepted. He was probably using a bit of historical hindsight as well, by projecting back into the past his displeasure because it was their unexpected successes at Pylos and Sphacteria that encouraged the Athenians to be more ambitious in their conduct of the war. And as a result, and as a result, they would find themselves with a weaker hand, but we are getting ahead of ourselves. Later that same summer in 425 BC, Nicias and two unnamed generals also launched a campaign whose purpose wasn't stated, 
He sailed into the Saronic Gulf and invaded Corinthian territory with 80 ships, 2,000 hoplites, a number of allied soldiers from Miletus, Andros, and Karistos, and 200 cavalry aboard horse transports. The force landed near the village of Solgia, which sat about 7 miles, or 11 kilometers, to the southeast of Corinth. But informers from Argos had warned the Corinthians of the impending invasion, and so about half of the Corinthian army had remained in the vicinity of Corinth, while the other half, under Battus and Lycophron, were already waiting at Solgia when the Athenians arrived. After the Athenians embarked from their ships, the two sides immediately met in a hoplite battle. Thucydides provides only a few details, but does say that the battle was hard fought on both sides. Ultimately, the Athenian right wing, which included the Charistians on the end of the line, was able to collapse Battus in the Corinthian left, and so the Corinthian army immediately retreated behind a wall on the rising ground behind them. There, they regrouped and began to throw large rocks at the Athenians pursuing them. Then, the Corinthians charged down the hill, and after the two sides engaged once again, a relief force had come down the hill to the aid of their left wing. Thucydides doesn't mention from where it came, but it was likely reserves from the towns in the vicinity. With their assistance, the Corinthian left was able to rout the Athenian right, and pursued them back to the sea. Meanwhile, the rest of the army for both sides fought tenaciously, especially the right wing of the Corinthians, under Lycophron, against the Athenian left. But after holding on for a long time, without either side giving way, the Athenian horse carriers finally arrived, and their cavalry would turn the tide of the battle. The Corinthians, who had no cavalry of their own, were routed on their right, and the whole army was forced to retreat up the hill and take up position behind the wall again. It was in this rout of their right wing that the Corinthians sustained the most losses, and they didn't offer to engage the Athenians for a third time. Afterwards, the Athenians stripped the dead and set up a trophy, but they were unable to capitalize on their victory, because at that moment, a much larger reserve force of older Corinthian men came rushing from the northeast to attack them. Not knowing that they were older reserves, and thinking that they were Peloponnesian reinforcements, Nicias and his men raced back to their ships with their loot and their own dead. Total Corinthian casualties were 212 men to only 50 Athenians. Plutarch provides an interesting anecdote by saying that after the Athenian war dead had been buried, Nicias noticed that two of his men were left unburied on the field. So he halted his retreat and sent a herald back to the enemy asking for leave to take up these dead bodies. It wasn't custom for the side which had won a victory and had control of the field to request a truce to take up its dead, because petitioners do not possess the field and cannot take or do what they want. And so, because Nicias had done this, he essentially was forfeiting his victory. So essentially, he would rather abandon the honor and reputation that came with his victory than to leave unburied two of his fellow citizens. Although this was a seaborne raid, the amount of risks taken against one of Sparta's most powerful Peloponnesian allies in a pitched battle was clearly not a part of Periclean strategy and the Athenians continued towards a more offensive strategy with the events that transpired next. Later that same day, the Athenian fleet sailed eastwards along the coast to the Corinthian town of Chromion, which was 13 miles or 21 kilometers from Corinth, and ravaged its territory but made no attempt to take the town itself. They laid anchor along the coast and passed the night there. The following day, they turned southwards and stopped at Methana, a peninsula on the eastern Peloponnesian coast, between Epidaurus and Troezen. At Methana, Nicias had his men wall off the narrow neck of the peninsula with fortifications. He left a garrison there before sailing off back to Athens. From this garrison, the Athenians could raid Troezen, Halias, and Epidaurus. Building a fort on the eastern Peloponnese was probably influenced by the success at Pylos in the west, as raids from Methana might force smaller towns, like Troezen and Halias, to come over to Athens, and they might be able to convince or even capture Epidaurus. With successes like these, it's conceivable that the Athenians believed that Argos might finally decide to become involved and join their alliance against Sparta. While these events in the Peloponnese were taking place, the Athenians also remained active in the west and the northwest. After their victories at Pylos and Sphacteria had concluded, Sophocles and Eurymedon sailed their fleet once again north to Corsaira, where the Corsairean civil war was still raging on. 
At the moment, the oligarchs had established themselves on Mount Estone and were using it as a base to launch assaults on the countryside and their democratic opponents in the city. As we mentioned earlier, this began to cause famine and the oligarchs had hoped that they could starve the democrats into submission. But the arrival of the Athenian fleet reversed the situation. And together with their democratic allies, the Athenians attacked the oligarchically controlled mountain fort of Estone. After Estone was captured, the oligarchs agreed to a surrender, but only to the Athenians, not the democratic Corsairians. The Athenians agreed, but only on the condition that they stand trial in Athens. The prisoners then were placed on the nearby island of Petikia for their protection until preparations were made for them to be sent back to Athens with the understanding that if one of them were caught running away, they would all lose the benefit of this truce. But the Corsairian Democrats were not happy with this situation, as they wanted blood and feared that the Athenians might spare the lives of their oligarchic-minded prisoners back in Athens. So they secretly sent some of their own men to the island of Pictia on a small boat to tell the prisoners that it would be in their best interest to escape as quickly as possible. Because the Athenian generals had changed their mind and were going to allow the Corsairian people to decide their fate. It doesn't make sense why they would believe their bitter enemies here. But some of the oligarchs fell for the trick and were subsequently caught attempting to escape in the boat that the Democrats had provided. Likely because the Democrats had tipped off the Athenians. And so, the Athenians declared the truce had been broken, and they washed their hands of the situation and turned the prisoners over to their homicidal enemies. This is precisely what the Democrats had hoped for, and it would have been terrible situational awareness on the part of the Athenians here if they didn't realize the consequences of their action. In fact, Thucydides makes it abundantly clear that he holds Sophocles and Eurymedon personally responsible for the terrible atrocities that came next because they easily could have prevented it, if they wished. The oligarchic prisoners were locked up in a large building and were taken out in groups of 20, bound together by a large rope. They were then led past two lines of hoplites, one on each side, and stabbed by their personal enemies. At the same time, men carrying whips walked around them and beat those who walked too slowly. Some also stood on the roofs and shot arrows at them. Those who were not killed with this torturous cruelty committed suicide, either by thrusting missed arrows into their throats, or by hanging themselves with strips of their clothing or bed cords that they were able to find from the large building where they were imprisoned. This happened all day long until nightfall, at which point every oligarchic minded Corsairian man had been killed. The next day, their bodies were thrown into wagons and carried out of the city, and their women and children were sold into slavery. This brought Stasis on Corsaira to its bloody conclusion, because according to Thucydides, quote, for of one party, there was practically nothing left, end quote. With Corsaira now exhausted, we will hear nothing more of them for about a decade. Afterwards, Sophocles and Eurymedon finally sailed west for Sicily, which was their intended destination all along. We will cover the happenings in Sicily from 425 to 424 BC on the next episode. Anyways, as the fighting season drew to a close, the Athenian allies also won another victory in the northwest. The garrison at Naupactus and the Acarnanians made an expedition against Anactorion, the Corinthian city lying at the mouth of the Ambracian Gulf, and took it by treachery, as was often the case with Greek sieges. The Acarnanians then expelled the Corinthians and colonized the city with settlers from all over Acarnania. The Corinthians took the loss of Anactorion fairly hard, as it further damaged their already waning prestige in this important region. This event ended Thucydides' account of the campaign season for 425 BC. At this point, Chios was the only member of the Athenian alliance who still supplied ships rather than tribute. Chios had been anti-Spartan during the Mytilenian Revolt and remained loyal to Athens. But in the winter of 425-424 BC, it started to build a new defensive wall, presumably because they had witnessed firsthand what happened to Mytilene and wanted to take precautions. When they heard of this, the Athenians started suspecting that the Chions were planning an insurrection, so they sent orders for them to cease and desist from building any further defensive fortifications. Remembering what happened to Mytilene when they were insubordinate, Chios was obedient to Athens' orders, and so nothing changed from the status quo, 
Thucydides provides this information, but we also have an inscription recording contributions to Sparta that includes, quote, the Chian exiles who are friends of the Spartans, end quote. So possibly, it was when Chios assured Athens of its loyalty that these men were sent into exile, likely because they were the ones who instigated the wall building in the first place. Regardless, these exiles either had been friends of Sparta all along, or now turned to their cause. It just goes to show that during the war, in any given city-state, there were likely both Athenian supporters, typically the Democrats, and those who favored Sparta, the oligarchs. In addition, Throughout the war, both sides had attempted to get help from non-Greek nations. Persia was the biggest prize of all, as both sides coveted the potential impact that the Persians could make on the war, either in their favor or in support of their enemy. In particular, the Spartans most notably had looked to Persia first. We already discussed in episode 92 the Peloponnesian envoys that were intercepted by the Athenians four years earlier. These were sent because the Spartans had learned quite painfully with a series of losses to Formio that they lacked the necessary funding for building and manning a large navy to take on the Athenians at sea, and Persian money and assistance would go a long way in rectifying that. It's not recorded if diplomatic correspondence between Sparta and Persia had completely discontinued since then, which is unlikely, but it was at least taking place again after Spartan failures at Pylos and Sphacteria which resulted in them losing their fleet, as we mentioned. We know of this because Thucydides says that a second embassy between Sparta and Persia managed to get captured over the winter of 425-424 BC, this time by an Athenian man named Aristides, who was a commander of the Athenian ships sent out to collect money from the allies. More on that shortly. The Persian envoy, who was carrying a message back to Sparta from the Persian monarch, was arrested at Eon on the Strymon River. He was taken to Athens, where the Athenians had his dispatches translated from Assyrian characters and read aloud. It's likely that when Thucydides says it was written in Assyrian characters here, he means that the message was written in Aramaic, rather than an old Persian cuneiform. Aramaic was one of the most widely used languages in the Persian Empire, and the fact that it could be so readily translated by the Athenians indicates that there were at least some people in Athens who were able to read it. Although this isn't unexpected, it's interesting to note that in addition to the various dialects of Greek that were spoken, there were many immigrant medics, especially in Athens, who would have spoken in their common tongue. As we've noted many times, Athens and most of the Greek world in general was very multicultural. Regardless, the Aramaic message stated, quote, In regard to the Spartans, the king did not know what they wanted. Though many envoys had come to him, they did not say the same things. If they wanted to say anything that was clear, they should send men to him in the company of the Persian messenger, end quote. As we can tell by this message, the Spartans were vague in their correspondence with the Persian king in the likelihood that it would be intercepted, because they were publicly claiming to be fighting against the Athenians for Greek freedom, and thus they would have been reluctant to hypocritically abandon the Asiatic Greeks to Persia, which no doubt would have been a minimum prerequisite for any Persian aid. Thucydides says that afterwards the Athenians tried to take advantage of the situation by sending their own envoys back to the Persian king with the intercepted messenger likely because they now had proof that the Spartans and Persians were in talks, as the first embassy had been intercepted before it reached Persia, and so they wanted to prevent any alliance between these two. Sure, they had the advantage now on the heels of Sphacteria, but a Sparta with Persian backing could quickly swing the pendulum. But when the envoys reached Ephesus, they learned that Artaxerxes had just died, and so they judged it to be a poor time to pursue negotiations and instead returned home. However, the dating of the reigns of Persian kings depends largely on dates found on Babylonian cuneiform tablets, with one curious exception, which is perhaps an error. All the Babylonian evidence shows that Darius II, who succeeded Artaxerxes, did not become king until the spring of 423 BC, at least 14 months after the date that Thucydides gives for the capture of the Persian envoy. So either Thucydides erred and assigned the incident to the wrong winter, or his use of the word afterwards, covers quite a long delay until Artaphernes was escorted to Ephesus. Both alternatives have caused issues with scholars. In addition, apart from that, Thucydides makes no mention of Athenian and Persian relations in the first half of the war, 
However, this likely wasn't the first and only time the Athenians also had reached out to Persia. In Aristophanes' Acarnians, as we had mentioned, an Athenian envoy that had spent years living in luxury at the Persian court had returned unsuccessfully without obtaining their money or alliance. Although this is comedy, and although Thucydides mentions the unsuccessful embassy, but not the successful one, there is no doubt that when Darius II had disposed of rival claimants and established himself as king by March 423 BC, the Athenians did make a treaty with him. It would have been even harder for them than for the Spartans to hand over the Asiatic Greeks. But in 423 BC, as we will see, both the Athenians and Darius II were insecure, and a non-aggression pact could have satisfied both sides. Regardless, we will cover the rise of Darius II to the Persian throne in a future episode. As we mentioned, Aristides was commanding an Athenian fleet that had been sent out to collect money from the Allies. Typically, tribute was due at the Panathenaic festival in the summertime. So the fact that he was out in the winter implies that the Athenians had reassessed their tribute. That's because over the winter of 425-424 BC, the Athenians finally took steps to alleviate their ailing financial situation. Pericles had stressed the vital importance of finances as a means of success in the war. This was directly linked with his strategy of keeping a firm hold upon the Allies, who at the beginning of the war were providing an annual income of about 600 talents. There was also a reserve of over 6,000 talents, and the Athenians had put aside 1,000 talents as a special reserve fund, which was only to be used if the city needed to be defended from an enemy attack by sea. In addition, the 100 best triremes of each year were to be put aside for the same purpose. It is in the area of finance that Pericles can be criticized for his failure to foresee that Athens' income would be insufficient for fighting a long, drawn-out defensive war. For example, the eventual cost of the siege of Potidaea was 2,000 talents. Expenditure at this level quickly drained the Athenian reserve, and it was left to his successors to attempt to resolve this problem. So over the winter of 425-424 BC, on the heels of their successes at Pylos and Sphacteria, a man named Thudippus, who was otherwise unknown, pushed through a decree that was most likely at the behest of Cleon. The Thudippus Decree, as it is called by scholars, reassessed the owed tribute for Athens' subject allies by doubling and in some cases tripling it. The total due now was over 1,460 talents from over 400 cities. The new decree also provided for the tough and efficient collection of the revenue, including some regions that had not paid in some time, and others, like the island of Milos, which had never contributed. Although the Athenians badly needed the money, they didn't dare do this earlier in the war for fear of future revolts, but now that they had no fear of Spartan interference for the time being, their great victory not only allowed, but emboldened them to demand it. Furthermore, for the first time since the beginning of the war, the Athenians were able to resume with their building program on the Acropolis. To celebrate their victory at Pylos, the Athenians raised a new temple to Athena Nike, the goddess of victory, which we described in great detail in episode 65. It was set on a bastion that jutted forward beside the main entrance, the Propylaea, and so the builders managed to capture in stone the brashness of Cleon and the pride that Athens took in this astounding victory. Cleon was at this point the most popular man in Athens. Included in the highest degree of civic honors that were bestowed upon him were free meals at the state's expense in the Pratanion, or town hall, which was the same reward that was often granted to Olympic champions. In addition, his recent appointment as general for 424 BC meant that he had a seat of honor in the front row of the Theater of Dionysus at dramatic festivals, such as the Linnea and City Dionysia. However, as we discussed, that doesn't mean he had everyone's approval. In fact, as his popularity soared with the people, his hatred among the wealthier classes rose equally, and one of his harshest critics in particular was the comedic playwright Aristophanes. If Cleon thought he had solved the end of him with the Babylonians and the Arcanians, he was most assuredly mistaken. Just like with the Arcanians, Aristophanes' second surviving play, The Hippies, literally meaning the horsemen, but known colloquially as the Knights, was performed at the Linnea in the winter of 425-424 BC. The Knights were citizens who were rich enough to own horses, and they were Aristophanes' natural allies against a populace such as Cleon, 
They occupied many of the state offices that were subject to annual audits, and Cleon specialized in the prosecution of such officials, often using his influence on jurors to obtain the verdicts that he wanted. As we discussed in episode 54, the Linnea Festival's chief object of veneration was an erect wooden phallus that was as tall as a human, and so it was particularly appropriate in setting the comedic tone here. In addition, the actors sported clownish pot bellies, while the men in the chorus waggled about their giant strapped-on phalluses, sometimes referred to as their oars. As one of the ten strategoi, for the first time, Cleon would have been seated in the front row. To his left and right would have been the priests, public benefactors, judges, and the other nine generals, including Demosthenes, Lamachus, Nicias, and the historian Thucydides. At his back was thousands of Athenian citizens. Taking place just nine months after his astonishing victory at Sphacteria, Cleon might have expected immunity from the body humor of Aristophanes. But once the night started, it quickly became evident that Aristophanes had written the play specifically to get his revenge on Cleon. The play is unique in the relatively small number of its characters, only five with speaking roles, which was due to its defamatory preoccupation with one man, the pro-war populist Cleon, who is clearly intended to be the villain. However, the play is also an allegory, as the characters are figures of fantasy, and the villain is a Paphlagonian slave, who is a comic monstrosity responsible for almost everything that's wrong with the world. Although his name is never given in the play, the context made it clear to the audience that he was to be equated with Cleon. There are also two other slaves that similarly were not given names and would have been understood to be Nicias and Demosthenes. The final two characters are a sausage seller named Agoracritus, literally meaning the chosen one in the marketplace, and an elderly man named Demos, literally meaning the people. Agoracritus represents a true, hard-working Athenian on the street, and he vies with Cleon for the confidence and approval of Demos, who resides in the Pnyx and symbolizes the Athenian citizen body. In the first scene, two actors dressed as kitchen slaves limp onto the stage, ailing from the recent beatings that were given to them by their master. The actors would have worn masks that each revealed a portrait of their characters. In this case, the images would have been of the generals Demosthenes and Nicias, so it would have been an obvious connection in the minds of the audience. Demosthenes first explains to the audience that he and his fellow slave serve a crusty old master named Demos, who is short-tempered and hard of hearing. At the last new moon, he had bought another slave, who was a leather maker. The naming of the new slave's occupation would have made it obvious to most that Aristophanes was implying a correlation with Cleon, since leather was the source of his wealth. Anyways, the new slave immediately started scheming to make Demosthenes and Nicias look bad, hence the beatings and bruises. Any doubts about the identity of his third slave were laid to rest when Demosthenes complained, quote, the other day, when I cooked up a Spartan cake at Pylos, he slipped by me, grabbed the dish, and brought it to the master as his own, end quote. The inference here is that Cleon is a thief who had stolen the credit for Pylos from Demosthenes, the true maker of the winning strategy. The slaves then inform the audience that Cleon has wheedled his way into Demos' confidence, and they accuse him of misusing his newfound privileged position for the purpose of extortion and corruption. Having no idea how to solve their problems, they pilfer some wine from the house, the taste of which inspires them to an even bolder theft, a set of oracles that Cleon has always refused to let anyone else see. On reading these stolen oracles, they learn that Cleon is one of several peddlers who was destined to rule the polis, but that it is his fate to be replaced by a sausage seller. And as chance would have it, a sausage seller passes by at that very moment carrying a portable kitchen on his way to the Agora. And so Demosthenes and Nicias decide to recruit him to supplant their rival, as the prophecy laid out. After finding that the sausage seller is reluctant to fall in line with their plans, Demosthenes finally informs him of his destiny, saying that tomorrow he would be ruler of all these rows of people, gesturing at the audience. Then, Demosthenes points out the myriads of people in the theater, not to mention the Agora, the Harbors, the Ecclesia, the Boule, and the Generals, and assures him that his skills with sausages are all that is needed to govern them. He tells him that he already has all of the qualifications necessary to be a perfect demagogue due to his low birth, little education, and disreputable career. 
Once the sausage seller is persuaded of his destiny, Demosthenes then begins to advise him on how to confront the terrifying leather maker, who he says that even the mask makers are afraid of, and so not one of them could be persuaded to make a caricature of him for this play. The slaves assure the audience, though, that we are clever enough to recognize him, even without a mask. It was even said that Aristophanes himself was the actor that played Cleon to spare any other actor the danger of his retaliation. Then, the suspicions of the slave playing Cleon had been aroused, and he rushes from the house in search of trouble. He bursts onto the stage roaring with fury. After he immediately finds an empty wine bottle, he loudly accuses the others of treason. Demosthenes calls upon the Knights of Athens for assistance, and a chorus of them charge into the theater. They converge on Cleon in military formation, under instructions from the chorus leader. Cleon is given a rough handling, and the chorus leader accuses him of manipulating the political and legal system for his own personal gain. In particular, Cleon's abuse of the auditing system is one of the complaints made by the chorus when it enters the stage, and they accuse Cleon of selecting officials for prosecution, like figs, according to their wealth and psychological vulnerability. They also accuse Cleon of manipulating census lists to impose crippling financial burdens on his choice of victims. Basically, he is decried as a cheat, liar, and an embezzler. Throughout the action, the chorus of aristocratic horsemen join in the verbal and physical attacks on Cleon, just as in the Ecclesia, where the real Cleon was opposed, though ineffectually, by the Athenian upper classes. In answer to their taunts, Cleon stirs up big winds with his tirades, and the other characters rough up their sails so as not to be blown off stage. Eventually, Cleon bellows to the audience for help, and the chorus urges the sausage seller to outshout him. And so a shouting match follows between Cleon and the sausage seller, with vulgar boasts and arrogant threats on both sides, as each man strives to demonstrate that he is a more shameless and unscrupulous orator than the other. In particular, Cleon at one point threatens to punish his enemies by assigning them old holes and rotten sails whenever they served as triarchs. Finally, the knights proclaim the sausage seller to be the winner of the argument, and so Cleon then rushes off stage to the boule to denounce them all on a trumped-up charge of treason. The sausage seller sets off in pursuit, and the action pauses for a parabasis, during which the chorus steps forward to address the audience on behalf of the author. The chorus informs us that Aristophanes has been very methodical and cautious in the way that he has approached his career as a comic poet, and we are invited to applaud him. The knights then deliver a speech in praise of the older generation, the men who made Athens great in the wake of the Greco-Persian Wars, and this is followed by a speech in praise of horses that performed heroically in a recent amphibious assault on Corinth, thanks to the arrival of Athens' new horse carriers. As we mentioned earlier, this was the Nicias-led assault on the Corinthian village of Solgia. In a bit of fantasy from the chorus, these horse carriers are imagined to have rode in gallant style, as the horses themselves had manned the oars and rode all the way to Corinth to attack the enemy. This seems to be an imaginative appeal by Aristophanes for a reconciliation between the masses and the elite, by combining comically the democratic navy and the aristocratic cavalry. No doubt, the relationship had been strained due to the anti-aristocratic fervor that Cleon had been pushing in the Ecclesia. Returning to the stage, the sausage seller reports to the knights on his recent battle with Cleon for control of the boule, as he has outbid Cleon for the support of the counselors with offers of meals at the state's expense. Indignant at his defeat, Cleon rushes onto the stage and challenges the sausage seller to submit their differences to Demos for arbitration. The sausage seller accepts the challenge, and they call the old man out of his house on the Paninx. After learning of their quarrel, Demos agrees that he would sit in judgment to hear them debate their differences, and he takes up his position on the Paninx, here represented possibly as a bench. He makes it known that his buttocks were still sore from his hard rowing at Salamis, which happened 56 years prior, and he was touchingly grateful when the sausage seller offers him a cushion to sit on. Cleon and the sausage seller then compete with each other by flattering Demos like rivals for the affections of an Aramenos or the younger lover in a pederastic relationship, as we discussed in episode 71. In the agon, or contest, that ensued, Cleon claims that he has done more for the city than the great Themistocles himself, and even quotes the famous wooden wall oracle about Athens' navy. The sausage seller counters that the appropriate wooden wall to enclose Cleon would be the public stocks. He then makes some serious accusations in the first half of the debate. 
by saying that Cleon is indifferent to the wartime sufferings of ordinary Athenians, that he uses the war as an opportunity for corruption, and that he prolongs the war out of fear that he will be prosecuted when peace returns. Ultimately, Demos is won over by the sausage seller's arguments, and he spurns Cleon's charming appeals for sympathy. Thereafter, the sausage seller's accusations became increasingly more absurd, as he says that Cleon is waging a campaign against anal intercourse in order to stifle opposition, because all the best orators love anal sex, and that he has brought down the price of silphium so that jurors who bought it would suffocate each other with their flatulence. Ultimately, Cleon loses the debate, but he doesn't lose hope, as there are two more contests in which he competes with the sausage seller for Demos's favor. The reading of oracles that are flattering to Demos, and a race to see which of them can best serve Demos's every need. But the sausage seller also wins these contests by outdoing Cleon in shamelessness. Cleon makes one last effort, though, to retain his privileged position in the household. He retrieves the oracle that describes his successor, and he questions the sausage seller to see if he matches the description in all of its vulgar details. When the sausage seller is shown to be an exact match, Demos asks him for his name, and we learn that it is Agoracritus, confirming his lowly origin. In tragic dismay, Cleon at last accepts his fate, and he surrenders his authority to the sausage seller. The actors depart, and the chorus treats the audience to another pair of asses. The knights step forward and advise that it is still honorable to mock dishonorable people. They then proceed to mock Ariphrates, an Athenian with a perverse appetite for female secretions. Next, they recount an imaginary conversation between some respectable ships that have refused to carry the war to Carthage because the voyage was proposed by Hyperbolus, another demagogue that they despise. We haven't encountered him yet, but he will rise to particular prominence in the following decade. Then, Agoracritus returns to the stage, calling for respectful silence and announcing a new development. He has rejuvenated Demos with a good boiling, just as if he were a piece of meat. The doors of Demos's house open to reveal impressive changes in his appearance, and he is now the very image of glorious violet-crowned Athens, as once commemorated in a song by Pindar. Agoracritus presents his transformed master with a well-hung boy and with a 30-year peace treaties, which were represented by two girls that Cleon had been keeping locked up in order to prolong the war. Eventually, Demos shows that his heart was in the right place and he casts off Cleon, who is carried off stage by the chorus of knights in the direction of the city gate, where he is required to sell sausages among the bathhouses and brothels for his crimes. Then, Demos promises that in the future, he will spend more of his funds on trireme building than on lawsuit hearings. Furthermore, he proclaims that when the navy comes home, the rowers will immediately receive their back pay in full. Demos then invites Agoracritus to a banquet at the town hall, and the entire cast exits in good cheer, except for Cleon, of course. We are unsure in what order Aristophanes performed his play at the Linnea, But after all three of the comedies had been presented, the competing choruses came out to the orchestra area so that the ten judges could determine which received the loudest applause and therefore was the victor. Despite the fact that we have so many of Aristophanes' plays surviving, while having none from anybody else, rarely did he prove himself to be a favorite of the audience and thus win first prize. So it must have been a particularly bitter moment for Cleon, who was sitting in the front row in full glare of thousands of his fellow citizens for the better part of an afternoon, when the applause for the knights erupted and Aristophanes was deemed the victor. Euripides followed that up with a performance of his play Hecuba at the city Dionysia in the early spring of 424 BC. The play takes place after the Trojan War, but before the Greeks have departed Troy. The central figure is Hecuba, the widowed wife of the recently deceased Trojan king Priam who was slain by Achilles' son, Neoptolemus, when Troy was taken. During the divvying up of the royal women of Troy, Hecuba was given as a slave to Odysseus. We discussed the play in great detail in episode 53, but its plot basically falls into two clearly distinguished parts. Hecuba's grief over the fate of her daughter, Polyxena, who was sacrificed to Achilles' shade, and the revenge that she takes on the Thracian king Polymestor, who had killed her young son, Polydorus.
With this play, Euripides begins to move away from his patriotic, anti-Spartan undertones that we've seen in his last two plays to formulate the first of a series of anti-war plays that demonstrate human suffering with immense power while condemning war and political expedience. Athens had endured the plague and had been at war now for seven long years, which after the death of Pericles was being prosecuted by demagogues like Cleon. And so the change in tone and mindset for a jaded Euripides here could possibly be considered to be representative of those men who are funding his plays as Choragoi. In fact, Odysseus in the play is represented as being agile-minded, sweet-talking, and demos-pleasing, as a type of wartime demagogue like Cleon that was active in Athens during this point in the war. Despite Aristophanes' roasting of him, Cleon's co-victory at Sphacteria had changed the nature of the war. The stalemate had been broken, and the Athenians held the advantage practically everywhere. Their financial problems were eased by the new imperial assessment, the possession of Spartan prisoners ended Peloponnesian raids on Attica, and the possession of the Spartan fleet ended any threat from the sea. Dynastic succession issues ensured that there was no immediate threat of Persian intervention, and the Athenian campaign in Sicily had guaranteed that the Greeks in the west were too tied up to help the Peloponnesians. With these advantages all in their favor, the Athenians were unwilling to come to terms on a peace agreement unless it benefited them to the greatest extent, and after they had broken the Spartans' will to fight them, which would ensure that the peace would be long-lasting. The biggest obstacles to this were Athens' longtime enemies, Megara and Boeotia, and so with increased prestige and confidence, the next few years would see a newly aggressive Athens, pursuing the war with more vigor and initiative. However, Athens' run of successes at Pylos, Factaria, Corinth, Methana, and Cathera the following year was followed by a run of failures in Megara, Boeotia, Sicily, and Thrace. This string of defeats, which will be the topic of the next episode, eroded Athens' position until they returned to the negotiating table with a much weaker hand than before. So join me next time on the History of Ancient Greece, Episode 96, Athens on the Offensive. (laughs) 